episode 3295, Love from Afar. Moms, it's time to rediscover, rejuvenate, and renew who you are in mind, body, and spirit. Welcome to Create Your Now, Your Best Selfie, the show to help you do just that. Here's your host, certified life coach, personal trainer, and nutritionist, Christiane Wargo. Happy, happy day. It's Friday. Yay! Can you believe it? Come on, come on, get excited with me. I know you've been looking forward to the weekend. Now, we've got the Pro Bowl happening. What are the things we've got going on? We've got basketball, and yes, we are a weekend away from the Super Bowl. But first, it's Confessions of an Upset Mama, love from afar. For those of you who are brand new to Creature Now, welcome to this incredible family. I'm so delighted of your presence. If you already even had the opportunity, you'll want to head on over to creaturenow.com where you can learn more and sign up for the Kisses newsletter. They keep it simple strategy, everyday solutions to live, love, and impact. Well, this episode is brought to you by AIM, inspiring connection and community. Well, take a deep breath because you know what? There are some days that you just don't even think you can take a deep breath, right? You're just so overwhelmed with life. Sometimes in a great way and other times you're like, yeah, not so much. You're just done with it. Well, in the journey of parenting, right? We can just become so laden with heartbreak. We can be laden with, I can't do this. I'm not good enough. And it's natural for parents to really want to be involved in every aspect of their child's life, right? We want to be there for them. Yet, it's also essential for parents to strike a balance between being present and giving the necessary space. Love from afar. And as you know, the love and and bond between a parent and a child are unparalleled, right? There's nothing like the relationship between mom and son, mom and daughter, or dad and son and dad and daughter. But if we're not careful, there comes a point where this love can inadvertently become suffocating, hindering the growth and maturation of our children. Yes, I used a big word. Even when I wrote that in my notes, I was like, that's a really big word. I actually looked it up because, you know, you use some words that just, you're like, is that really the right meaning? Well, it is the right meaning. And that's truly where our children are maturing in their development. And you know, we all go through stages of life, right? And and we're measured that way. When you take your kids in for the well checkup, they're being measured for a reason because if not, we have incredible science and interventions now that can actually help our children better. And you wanna catch things early if at all possible. Well, I'm here to say, let's catch things early for us as parents. You know, because I don't know about you, but I want my children to be strong and independent. I don't want them to be codependent on me. I want them to be able to impact the world they touch with their gifts and talents. I want them to grow up. Yes, grow up and like move on out, move it on up, move it on up. Okay, what is that show too? Okay, that really dated me, didn't it? Yeah, that's an old, old show. I'll think of it here in a minute. Maybe I'll include it in the show notes. But, you know, our responsibility as parents is to give them the launching pad so they can live a life well-lived. And when you think about it, we only have 18, maybe 20 years on average that our children need us, give or take, right? Maybe some of them go through college or whatever, and they're like, hey, can we hang out a little bit longer? And you help support them and give them that foundation so they can save money, whatever it is. And then they have their whole life ahead of them, like 60, 70, 80, 90 years. That's incredible, right? Lord willing, but we have to look and and say, okay, what are some practical ways as parents that we can love from afar, fostering this healthy growth and maturity in their children at their different stages of life. How do you truly love from afar? That is your kiss to keep it simple strategy. Because obviously the age of the child determines how you lead them well, so they can live well. And so today I want to look at it a little bit differently. I want to break down the stages of life. And of course, you can take some of this stuff and duplicate it with some tweaks. And, you know, some of it can flow into the others. Like if we're looking at elementary age, middle school, high school, into college and adult. And and you can take all of it and say, okay, well, I can utilize this during this stage of life. Yes, you can. So this is not like sealed and, you know, the deal is not done, that this is the only way you can do that. These are just ideas that I want you to think about because you might be a grandma right now who's going to have grandchildren coming up to the elementary age. So maybe you don't have elementary age children yourself, but what can you do as a grandma to, you know, encourage 
that independence? What does that look like, right? So we can look at all things. Maybe you teach a Sunday school class. Maybe you're a teacher yourself and, or you're a substitute teacher and you go into different ages and you're like, okay, well, I need to mentor. I need to teach them this way in high school or this way in middle school. So they respond to me accordingly. And a lot of times we just don't think about that. We are too busy. We've got so many things happening. And I know I've had so many meetings the last couple days and lots of things are happening here at Creature now. And there's also a lot of moving parts in our own family and um, my children and what they're doing. And I want to be there to support them. Yet I have my own stuff too. And so it is finding that balance where we are in life. And I'm not here to tell you there's a right way or a wrong way, but you need to find a way to love from afar. And if we do take a few minutes once in a while and say, gosh, am I doing this right? Could I do it better? Could I do it differently? What's another way to approach this? That begins to change the conversations in our head and how we deal with our kiddos, but it also changes the conversation with our children. And that's important because our relationships evolve with our children over time, right? I got this adorable, adorable, precious little granddaughter, and she is beautiful, and she can do no wrong right now. She just turned three months, and my goodness, she has a smile that lights up the room. And right now, where is she at three months old? She needs everybody to tend to her needs, right? You got to wipe the bottom. You got to feed the mouth, right? You've got to protect her. You got to keep her safe. You've got to make sure that she has all of her shots or that she's eating well, whatever it is, right? She's got to have tummy time. Even right now, she doesn't like tummy time, right? That's all of our doing. But then you move on and they become an elementary age or even preschool age. I've got a grandson who's three years old. Okay, he's beginning to ask a lot of questions, but right now, what does he see things as? Black and white. There is no gray middle ground. And so you have to be careful with how you present things to him because he's like, well, if you did this, I can do it. Not necessarily, right? Because we are different as adults than we are as a three-year-old or a three-month-old or a 13-year-old, or a 30-year-old. Get my drift here? So how can you love from afar? What does it look like? Well, let's break down some basic stages of life and talk about it a little bit further. Let's start with elementary age. Number one, encourage independence through responsibility. So for parents of elementary age children, it is important to instill a sense of responsibility. Allow them to complete age-appropriate tasks independently, like packing their school bag or making their bed. Now, it may not be made military style, right? Their bed, yeah, they're not going to get that tuck and fold just right, but they can throw the covers up. They can make sure their pillow is in their place. They can make sure if they had that special blanket or that special uh, stuffed animal that they are placed on their bed ready for nap time or ready for you know, bedtime, whatever it is. And this not only teaches them the essential life skills, but also boosts their confidence and gives them a sense of accomplishment. One thing my grandmother told me years and years and years ago, and I find it very interesting that, um, you know, she shared this with me. My mom didn't tell me this, but it was my grandma. And I don't even remember when she first shared it with me. And she shared many stories with me, but this one was one that she would repeat And I'm like, okay, I guess I was really the big sister. But one of the things was my brother and I are four years apart. I'm the oldest of three siblings, of three of us. And she told me that it was my responsibility to pack the diaper bag for my brother. And if I forgot to pack something, then it was my fault. You know, if I forgot to pack the bottle, well, then he didn't get fed. Well, that's a big responsibility. And some people would be like, well, isn't that really, you know, fall on mom or dad's shoulder? Yeah, but I was that kind of mama figure. I liked being that and it boosted my confidence. I had responsibility. And so when we would go to church, I would have to pack the bag. If we went grocery shopping, I had to pack the bag. If we went, you know, wherever we were going, I packed the diaper bag. I'm sure I made mistakes. I have no idea. She never told me that part of the story. (laughs) And and maybe we don't want to remember that part of the story, you know, where he he doesn't get to eat. But um, I got to tell you, it definitely encourages independence. Now, I don't remember that back then. I do have other memories of what I did. But it's one of those things where in that moment, I know it did something for my self-esteem. 
because it built me up in other areas and I could trace back, oh my goodness, I can see why maybe I lead in a certain way. Not just because I packed a diaper bag, but you get my drift, right? Number two, support social interactions. We have got to encourage our kids to participate in extracurricular activities and social events. Come on, what's happening right now? Look at the world. We are tech savvy and we're becoming our own worst enemy because we don't know how to communicate. So we have got to support social interaction. And this is going to provide our kiddos with opportunities to interact with their peers, develop social skills like actually talking, like what does that look like, and learn how to navigate different social dynamics. You know, as parents, support their involvement, all right? That's what we need to do while giving them the necessary space to explore and make their own choices. We homeschooled our kids for years. And one of the things we did was we really looked at each individual child, what would be best for them. And that was really the key for us. We didn't want to just say, okay, blanket, this is what we're going to do. And it's going to happen for all kids. We had five kids and literally every single one of them are so unique. Now, some people would say, well, duh, everybody's unique. Yeah, but sometimes when you have the same mama and the same data, right, you get the same kind of, well, I'm just going to lead this way. And you never really lead to the individual, right? And that is a danger zone there, okay? We could spend hours upon weeks upon months talking about that. And this is where my husband and I were very specific. We wanted to look at each child as an individual and see them for who God created them to be. And so we have one child. I won't name him. I Oh, well, okay, now you already know. It's one of the three boys. And actually, all of my kids are incredibly intelligent. But one definitely stood out. And we noticed this very, very early on. He was actually... Uh, learning his phonetics, knew his phonetics at the age of two. And no, I am not stretching the truth. He was reading, full on reading at the age of three. Okay. He finished kindergarten by the end of three. And we noticed some things that he was one who was just enjoyed being by himself. Like he could do things and he loved it. He didn't want to have the social interaction, but I knew what was best for him. And so I was teaching in school at the time and we got permission to put him in school. He'd already done kindergarten homeschooling with us, but I wanted to put him in truly, truly for the whole reason being social interaction. And that's what we did. So at the age of four years old, he turned four, okay, in kindergarten. So he was very young. Um, we put him into kindergarten and it was a private school. They worked with us. He was very good. He was one of 10 children in his class. It was perfect. Why did we do that? To develop social skills, to have him interact with his peers. Now, yes, he had his brothers and sisters, but we wanted him to have even more interaction. That was one of the best things we ever did. But if we're not looking at things like that for our children, we're going to miss the mark as parents. And you don't want to miss that. You want to see your child for who they are, being able to give them what they need individually. Okay, so that's elementary age. Let's look at middle school. Number one, foster open communication. You know how tough middle school years are, right? And children may begin to assert their independence and seek more privacy. Like, don't talk to me, mom. Like, "Ah, no more hugs, right? They don't want the hugs. They're kind of pushing back a little bit. They may hug when no one's around, but don't drop them off at school and give them a hug. Like, no, taboo. And it becomes crucial for parents to create a safe and open environment for communication. So invite conversations about their daily life, school, and hobbies. Ask, ask, ask questions, Lots of questions. When they are in your car and you're driving them from point A to point B, you need to not be thinking about the dinner dishes and dogs or the laundry or the linen closet. You need to be focused on your child sitting right next to you and having conversation because that drive is going to be the most pivotal time in their day. They will talk to you more than I have talked to Hundreds, if not thousands of parents who said, yep, that's what my kids talk. It's crazy, I know, but it's like they have their personal space, but yet they'll open up. So let them know your door is always open should they ever want guidance. You know, we can't be 
judgmental because they're already being judged in middle school. Middle school's a tough age. And it doesn't matter where you fit in that middle school. If you don't have a middle school in your area, you're looking at anywhere from the end of fifth grade all the way to like eighth grade, sometimes into ninth grade, okay? And so depending upon your school system, maybe you even homeschool, you'll find that the kids, oh, begin to shift and, and things happen. And then number two, encourage self-reflection. Middle schoolers are at an age where figuring out their identity and values become more significant. So encourage them to engage in that self-reflection, looking what introspectively and explore their interests and passions. Provide resources and support. Maybe you've got to find a good book for them to read that helps them make sense. Maybe you reach out. If you attend church, maybe they go to the middle school group, youth group, and it just allows them to you know, become who they are becoming and gives them a space outside of just mom and dad, right? And it allows them to have that freedom, which helps them shape their own opinions and make decisions. Now, you're not going to tell them, well, let's see, what do you want to be when you grow up? They may have an idea at this point. You still want to guide them, but don't dictate to them. That's the key with middle schoolers. You want to guide them, but not dictate to them. And a lot of times we're just like, you have to do this. You, de- you need to be doing this. You know what? When they're in elementary, so you've got preschoolers into elementary, they're trying lots of different things. Well, their time becomes limited and school becomes a little more challenging. So middle school is like, okay, we need to start paring down some things. So maybe they can't do five activities. They only can pick three activities. Well, that's not for you to decide, right? Allow them to be a part of the conversation. Help them, guide them, but don't say this is what you have to do, okay? Because that will burn you later on as we go into the high school and then college and adult years. So let's move on to high school. Number one, empower decision-making. High school, oh my goodness, is a critical transitional period in a teenager's life. It is critical. Parents can love from afar by empowering their children to make their own decisions. Give them the power. Encourage them to take ownership of their academic choices. So instead of like, oh, I want to go to my friend's house tonight and it's a Tuesday night and you're like, but you have two tests this week, ask questions around, you know, what are your goals for this? Because if they're wanting to go to medical school, right, let's say, um, then they're going to have to start making some good choices right now in high school that get them into a good solid college that gives them the foundation to what then apply to medical school and plus all the decisions that they do, right, it's going to lead up. It's building blocks off of each other. And a lot of times we don't see it that way. It's like, oh, we just have to make a decision that works right now. No, consider your decisions as building blocks. And that changes the landscape and the tapestry of your conversation with your kids. So encourage them to take that ownership of their academic choices, their extracurricular activities, how to downsize, right? We as, you know, empty nesters at times, right? We, it's like, oh, should we downsize or not? Well, it just depends. You know, if you have a large family, maybe downsizing isn't the right thing. But if you all live in the same town, maybe downsizing is the best thing, right? It just depends. Look at their personal goals. Have them write down some personal goals, right? And this is going to inspire self-confidence and truly It'll help foster that growth, that you got this, man. You you can do this. And it's hard. High school is hard. And it's becoming even more challenging, right? If you've got kids now that are going for the gusto and wanting to get all these scholarships, man, decision-making is going to be critical in their education in high school and what they do. And then number two, support goal setting and planning. You have got to help your high schooler set realistic goals. Yes, they can dream big, but you got to bring it back to the reality part of things so they can help and learn to create a plan to achieve them. So let's go back to being the doctor, right? If you are wanting, if your child says, mom, dad, I, I want to be a doctor. Okay, great. What does that mean? And if you don't know what that means, get help. Like ask somebody, find a mentor for them and say, what does this look like? How did you do that? You know, maybe you have a friend. If not, ask a counselor at school. I guarantee you there are people in schools that have contacts. And if 
They, if your child wants to do something that you're not familiar with, then get them in touch with somebody who is familiar with it. So then they can say, okay, you want to do this? Then you can, you know, these are the steps that you need to do for goals. This is what you need to do to plan. This is what it looks like. So instead of dictating their path, right, you guide them. You help them map out their steps to reach aspirations. It may be even, wait, 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 let's slow down a little bit. You can't do all of this. You need to do some of it, but you may have to cut back on the extracurricular activities. You can't be in the band, be in cheerleading, be in dance, and play volleyball, and run track. Like Something's got to give because you also have academics here, and you've got to score really, really good. So number one, you get scholarships because, man, med school is not cheap. And you've got to build upon that, right? You want to set a firm foundation so as they continue to college, into med school, into residency, into fellowship, they can be successful, right? So when you do this, it helps promote what? Self-discipline, time management skills, right? These are all life skills. A sense of, I got this, called responsibility. And that's pivotal in a high schooler's life. But a lot of times... We don't do that, and neither do the schools. The schools don't take time to set them up. Now, you may, we were very blessed. We had kids um, at this point in our life. They did go to a traditional high school, and so they were able to get some good, sound teaching and what they did. We love that. We tried to do our best, too, but we also piggybacked off of the school system, so we worked together as a team, right? That's what you got to do when it comes to raising kiddos. And then finally, let's look at college and grown adults. Now, This is a hard one because, you know, some people say at 18, we cut you off. You're out on your own. Like you go figure it out. Other parents are like, oh, we're going to support you. You can live under the roof. You have whatever, you know, rules to follow. So you've got to look at this for you. But I want you to think about these couple things. Number one, maintain a supportive presence during their college years and beyond. It is important, period, for us as parents to be a supportive presence presence. Be available for guidance, right? Lend an empathetic ear. Sometimes they just need to rant at you, not at you because you're the problem, just at you because they don't know what else to do. They don't know who else to turn to. They don't feel comfortable going to their professors. Now, I will say this, you need to guide them back and say, okay, if this is the problem, where would you go? Again, it comes down to asking questions. And if you don't know the answer, and send them to someone who does. Send them to their advisor in college or send them to a counselor or someone in church that you know and trust and you know you would be taking care of their kids too if they came to you, right? As if they were your own. Those are the kind of people you want to send your kiddos to. Acknowledge that they're adults capable of making their own decisions and learning from their experiences, but you're supporting them at the same time. And so that is a fine line. It's like, oh, I want to be the all in. But then it's like, oh, pull back. I can't be that helicopter drone parent. I can't be that crazy one that makes all the decisions for them. Now, sometimes, yes, you do have to put your foot down. I get it. If you're paying for college, I get it, mom and dad. You know, you get some say. But remember this, they also can have some say too because they could go and find their own way to pay for college. So think about that too, right? Think about how you address situations and circumstances. How are you supportive in their life during this season that they're in? And it's a hard balance. I get it. Man, sometimes I'm really good at it. And other times I'm like, fall on my face, failed. But then you know what? I apologize and I say, okay, that wasn't really good of me or I overset my bounds. I'm sorry, you know, can we start again? And it's all right, own your junk. It's okay, mom, own it. Uh, But we do have to understand that that supportive presence is key. We may not always agree with them. Uh, I know we went through this with one of our kiddos, and we were like, no, we don't think this is really the right thing, but we also couldn't come right out and say this is not the right thing. We needed that child to go through the process of doing it, to actually dig in deeper, to ask some hard questions, to go back. And we knew eventually it would come back around. And finally it did, praise the Lord. And we believe that this child is back on track again. Not that they were ever off track, but doing what they were doing, we were like, we just want to make sure that that's the case. But we needed that child to figure out some of the stuff 
on their own without mom and dad interfering. And that's hard to do. It's hard to shut your mouth. It just is. But you can do it and still maintain a supportive presence. And then finally, number two, respect boundaries. Ooh, gulp. <laughs> yeah, this is when it's like, swallow your pride, mom. Yeah, just do it. As your child ventures into adulthood, right, it is necessary to respect their boundaries. And while you may still be their trusted source of wisdom, avoid imposing your opinions or decisions on them, right? This is where they get to figure it out. And it's not easy. It's not easy to watch them figure out some health issues. It's not easy to have them figure out, gosh, what is my major going to be? It's not easy for them to figure out, how do I go and buy my car? Now, I'm not saying you don't give them help and support and guidance, right? But let them come to you. Don't just say, I got the answer, right? It's not raise your hand and I'll do this for you. Let them walk through it. Ask those questions to push them in the right direction so they have to think on their own. Allow them the freedom to carve their own path, even if it differs from your expectations. And as much, as much as we try not to uh, place expectations on our kiddos, we do. We do it. And I mean, I'm one who really tries not to, but I know I do. It, It just is what it is because you want what's best for your kiddo. You want them to shine. You want them to have the best life, better than your life. And it's not like my life was bad or my husband's life was bad. No, but you want it even better, right? When they're growing up and when they're going out into the adult world, you don't want them to have to work as hard or to face things that you did. But you know what? Sometimes what they face is the only way they learn. And they've got to figure that out. Love from afar is about creating a nurturing environment where your child experiences the freedom to grow while also knowing they have a loving support system. And that's really key. And it's hard to do that. I I get it, but it can be done. So remember, loving from afar does not mean relinquishing parental love or guidance. It does not mean that. You're still there for them. You should always be there for them. But it does mean finding the right balance of being present and allowing your children the necessary space to become the independent individuals. The last thing you need in your life is codependency of your child to you when they grow up. You should not wish that on any child. They need to be able to go out and impact the world that they touch with their gifts and talents. And when you practice these techniques in the various stages of their lives, you can truly foster healthy growth and maturity. It helps them, what, grow up, ultimately shaping them into well-rounded adults. And we know that's what we want for them, right? That's our dream is to be able to go out into the world and impact the world that they touch. I love my kiddos, but when I send them out into the world and God calls them to go do what they're supposed to do, I only want them to come back and visit, right? I don't want them to be like, oh, well, you know, I'm just kind of tired about this. So I'm just going to come and live with you, mom. Yeah, no. I want them to figure things out now. I want them to dig deeper. I want them to learn more about who they are becoming. I want them to figure out their values in life. Where do they want to lead from? I want them to build their family. Yes, I know I will have influence over that because I raised them. And so did my husband, but they still have to create this foundation for their family and what it looks like, right? It's going to look different. Why? Because it involves two different people, all right? They don't have mom and dad there creating their family. They have them and whoever their partner is, whoever their spouse is. So loving from afar is a gift that you give your children. It truly is. So don't think that you're doing a disservice to them. You're actually giving them the gift of opportunity. Go in peace, be present, be incredible, be you. I love you so very much. I cannot wait to see you on the other side. Blessings, hugs, and lots and lots of love. We'll talk to you real soon. Have a glorious, blessed weekend. Bye-bye. Feeling inspired, ready to train for life, and love your journey? Visit createyournow.com for more incredible resources to help you along the way. We'll see you next time on Create Your Now, Your Best Selfie. And remember, always be sure you consult your physician before beginning any health and fitness plan.